welcome, welcome all. Uh, this is uh, um, another in our series of RN Center uh, talks for the year. Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz, and uh, as you mostly know, I run the RN Center for Politics and Humanities here at Bard. Um, tonight, uh, we have a, a really, I think, super interesting talk, one that uh, well, promises to be a super interesting talk, and one that I think many of you, uh, knowing the Bard student body, uh, will be quite interested in. Um, before I, I, I introduce tonight's lecture, uh, let me just um, make a few announcements. Um, on Thursday, uh, as many of you know, uh, Chris Hedges will be speaking, uh, I think at 4.30 or 5 o'clock, uh, just down the hall. Um, on Monday, um, uh, Edna Brock uh, will be speaking. She's Hannah Arendt's niece uh, and heir. Um, if people are interested in, in, in it's going to be a more private talk, but if people are interested in um, in seeing that, they should contact me through email, and I'll put you on a list and tell you how to attend that. Um, and then next Tuesday, at the same time, in the same place, um, Michael Steinmann will be talking about Heidegger and Arendt on politics. Um, so I encourage you to come back next Tuesday, the 17th, the same time, the same place, for, for that talk. Uh, a week from that Wednesday, so the 25th of April, uh, there's going to be an interesting, a very interesting talk, I think, on Hannah Arendt and Neil Strauss by Thomas Meyer, uh, coming in from Germany. Uh, and I hope you can, can attend those as well. Um, tonight's talk uh, is, is by Trevor Norris. Um, Trevor Norris uh, has a PhD from the University of Toronto and now teaches at the University of Toronto. Um, he is one of the people I've had the pleasure to meet uh, uh, virtually um, running the center. People often contact me and ask for this or ask for that. Um, and often one has to fend them off. Um, not just because you know, for whatever reason, it's not always interesting to what we're doing or relevant to what we're doing. But uh, Trevor actually was one of those people who, when we got in touch, was doing things that sounded to me deeply interesting. Uh, he sent me his book, um, Consuming Schools, Commercialism and the End of Politics, uh, which um, uh, I have had the pleasure to discuss with a number of my students, and uh, I think it's a book that really deserves an audience and deserves to be read widely. Um, there is a, and what's nice about it from our perspective is that he takes very seriously and meaningfully Arendt's dis uh, discussion of consumerism uh, from the section of the human condition. Um, and so uh, it's a pleasure to have him here today, as I said, from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education one of the really leading uh, uh, places in, in North America where one can discuss education not as simply, uh, not as simply a credential, but as a, a, an aspect of the humanities, as a part of the humanities. So, uh, in any case, his lecture today uh, is a gloss on the chapter of his book on Arendt, and it's titled, Consuming the Polis, Arendt's Account of the Rise of Consumerism, and I'm really pleased to have uh, Trevor here, so welcome. Thanks very much. Alright, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, and thank you for coming here tonight. I know it's a busy time of year for many reasons. Um, one uh, additional point I didn't mention to Roger by way of uh, background introduction is so I've been teaching philosophy education uh, in an education faculty at the University of Toronto, uh, and I focus on, on political issues and politics and education. And one recent initiative actually is to begin offering teach education in high school philosophy. Uh, Ontario is one of the only places, as I understand it, in the English-speaking world that uh, offers philosophy uh, as a part of the public education system. There's about 30,000 students a year that are taking grade 11 and grade 12 philosophy courses uh, for about 12 years now. And until this point, there's been no teacher education in philosophy. Uh, 
so beginning this year, I taught the first course preparing people how to teach high school philosophy. So I think you see this still very much uh, in line with the Rand Sublinger Plato project um, by making you know, more direct connection with educational. Um, all right, so tonight uh, I'm going to talk about the book Consuming Schools, and I'm going to focus on one of the chapters which is uh, intensively or exclusively on a rent. Uh, but I'm also going to set that chapter kind of in a larger context of the project, uh, the whole book as a whole. Um, so it's a rather long chapter, and I went through it very closely and eliminated quite a bit of it. Um, a lot of what I did in there was kind of preparing the reader and giving, you know, background concepts and, uh, you know, getting up to speed and who a rent was and a bit of biographical background and so on. So I'm going to skip a lot of that and really just focus more uh, intensively on uh, the place of consumerism in her work, specifically uh, in the human condition. As, as far as I can tell, and I confirmed this a few weeks ago, there's really no one that's linking uh, or looking at the, the place of consumerism in Arendt's work. Uh, and I think it's a really important part in, in looking at Arendt with this concept in mind uh, has uh, given me a new way of reading her, a new way of, of understanding her. Okay, uh, so bear with me. Uh, I'll start with an overall uh, general impression of the project of the book and then get more intensively into the Arendt chapter. Okay, uh, so the book deals with the origins and nature of consumerism and how it's impacting politics and education. Some of the central guiding questions are things like is consumerism equivalent to modernization? Uh, does consumerism promote a kind of global cultural homogeneity? Is it a new form of imperialism, what some people have called a soft imperialism? And then, more specifically, what is its impact on politics? I think it's important to differentiate between consumption as a component of living and consumption as an ideology, or when consumerism intrudes into all walks of life, or all parts of life. I think also that when we are asking about consumerism, we are also asking some of the most important questions we can ask about ourselves. And I believe some of the most important questions that we can ask about our current times. My starting point is that consumerism is about more than just the physical transaction of a purchase. In the book I start at this concept, but I don't uh, stop there. Uh, consumerism is not only about shopping, but I argue it is also a way of being in the world, a way of relating to the other, a way of engaging in politics, uh, and a set of values we bring to our educational endeavors. Because of consumerism, we begin to see everything that appears in the world as phenomena that are at our disposal for human use. That everything is to be rendered available to us and for us. Consumerism is an ideology insofar as it is a hegemonic worldview that is normalized naturalized and socially pervasive, yet often invisible and unquestioned. <clears throat> uh, so today I begin with an overview of the book and then focus more intensively on the Arendt chapter. I think that we are really only beginning to understand the causes and the character of consumerism, and this is in part because for many recent centuries, the focus has been more on the importance or impact of production. This is something that is shared with Adam Smith, Karl Marx, Max Weber. It's really only in the 20th century that consumerism has become a more important topic for consideration. For example, that there has been a shift uh, by which people identify less as workers or producers than they do as consumers. One recent development I've actually been working on since the book came out is the notion of nation branding, the, pr the practice of, of uh, hiring marketers and advertisers to create a new image for a country. In part, this is to promote tourism, uh, but also to attract immigrants. Now, what I find interesting about this is a direct conflation of politics and, uh, and image making. A key concern I have is regarding the transition we are experiencing from the citizen to the consumer. One of the ironies is that as we decreasingly identify as citizens, corporations are now stepping in to claim that they are citizens. 
as we become consumers, corporations become citizens. They become political because they claim the political category of citizenship. But ultimately, I argue that politics would be better if we consider ourselves to be citizens rather than passing on that responsibility over to corporations. Uh, okay, so I think I'm going to jump to the introduction of the book and read a few paragraphs. So I start, uh, like many, I was very much impacted by 9-11, and that's one of my opening points. But I was also very much impacted by what happened in the weeks afterwards. In the days after the attacks of 11 September 2001, George Bush sought to provide reassurance, strength, and direction to a disoriented American people. Joining a long tradition of great orators in times of struggle, his inspiring words galvanized a nation and reflected what has become the defining spirit of the American people. He called upon the American people to go shopping. Amid the tumult and distress of those shocking days, the peculiarity of this conflation of greeting and consuming was easily overlooked and forgotten. That it would be the responsibility of a democratically elected leader to call upon the people to shop is surely a perversion of the meaning of political leadership and political speech. Had Bush himself not raised the topic, it might otherwise seem offensive or inappropriate to bring up shopping in the context of war. Indeed, Benjamin Barber wonders if it is proper to criticize consumerism in a time of war, asking, quote, how much should we care? In an age when terrorism stalks the planet, when fear of jihad is as prevalent as the infringement of liberties to which fear gives rise, when aids and tsunamis and war and genocide put democracy at risk in both the developing and the developed world, it may seem self-indulgent to fret about the dangers of hyper-consumerism. Yet dramatic and provocative images of war and violence might otherwise conceal the quiet and gradual spread of consumerism. A month later, Bush reiterated the same message. Quote, we cannot let the terrorists achieve the objective of frightening our nation to the point where we don't conduct business, where people don't shop. This thoroughgoing equation of America's strength as a nation with, quote, consumer confidence, perhaps was intended simply to reassure the populace by conveying a sense of normality. Yet it is radically unlike the words spoken by other great political leaders in times of turmoil, and radically different from the slogans of the Second World War about the importance of courage, frugality, and investing in war bonds. Consider, for example, Winston Churchill's profound and inspirational speech to the British people on June 4, 1940, in which he passionately declared, quote, We will fight them in the beaches, we shall fight them in the landing grounds, we shall fight them in the fields and the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Today, a trip to Walmart is said to perform the same political function and express equivalent love of country. In the weeks that followed, for uh, many American cities coast to coast participated in, quote, America Open for Business, an initiative intended to help encourage consumption and boost consumer confidence. Numerous corporations also tapped into patriotic shopping, and some began selling, quote, patriotic shopping totes. Florida Governor Jeb Bush agreed with his brother about the importance of shopping as a patriotic duty. Quote, we need to respond quickly uh, so people regain confidence and consider it their patriotic duty to go shopping. Vice President Dick Cheney claimed that shopping was not only an act of patriotism, but also an act of military aggression, describing shopping as a way for ordinary citizens to, to quote, stick their thumbs in the eyes of the terrorists. Uh, ironically, a few months later, Bush insisted, quote, too many have the wrong ideas of America as shallow, materialistic consumers. But this isn't the America I know. Yet five years later, at a press conference, he restated his original solution, quote, I encourage you all to go shopping for. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I then get into uh, more global politics and talk about the relation between America and China. We've heard a great deal about the difference in savings rates, for example. Uh, and back in 2006, uh, and even earlier, uh, Greenspan and others were putting pressure on China to 
decrease their savings rate, or uh, I think he said something like reduce their savings rates, or some kind of obscure uh, economic terminology. That what, what was behind that was the notion that global political stability is dependent on every country in the world uh, promoting consumerism as much as possible. But if there are any, any countries in the world who have kind of, uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, for example, a focus on tradition or this kind of thing, um, and they don't consume as much as other countries, then there's going to be uh, the consequence will be political instability. Okay, so uh, from there I, I trace a bit of the history of the rise of consumerism, some of which I mentioned already, the focus on the importance of reduction, uh, but also one can view the 20th century, or at least the conflict between the Soviet Union uh, and the West as defined in part in terms of which political system was more effective at so-called delivering the goods, at, at uh, promoting consumerism. And I also get a bit into the etymology of the word consumption itself, some tensions uh, in that. For example, on the one hand, it, we, can, we think of consuming as, uh, as in the expression of the fire consumed a building, that it means to, like, to destroy something or to break down something, to, to, to break something or end it, on the one hand. But on the other, coming from the Latin, there's, there's a contradictory meaning of consumption, which means to consummate, to complete, or to fulfill something. So one of the interesting dynamics about consumerism is that it, I think both of these dynamics are at play, that consumerism had the function of uh, destroying or breaking something at the same time that, that part of its attraction or its, or its uh, prevalence can be explained by the fact, by the way in which it can offer the uh, appearance of completing something or some kind of satisfaction. Uh, and then I get uh, more into the way in which schools today are increasingly uh, serving as sites for the promotion of more and more consumerism. This is something that is happening in Canada. Uh, but far more so in the U.S., and not only through kind of administrative organizations, uh, things like vouchers or charter schools, that kind of thing, uh, which we don't have in Canada, but I look more closely at the way in which um, school business partnerships are being developed, or uh, advertising in classrooms being encouraged, uh, or things that are being sold in the cafeteria, and that kind of thing. What I think is important there, or what is at stake, is the question about, uh, question whether schools are going to be sites for critical engagement with consumers, and I think they're one of the last uh, institutions in our culture where consumers can actually be an explicit topic uh, for engagement uh, in the classroom, obviously in places like civics, but I think in many other subject areas. Uh, so I kind of set the context with the, the rise of these commercial relationships and increasing uh, pressure from commercial interests to gain access to the student body, and reasons that they would want to gain access to the student body in the first place. Some of them, I think, are fairly self-evident. Like, for example, there are so many to be made selling coke or other things in the cafeteria. But I think those those cases can kind of uh, uh, they can obscure other larger, more significant dynamics. That it's not only about making money. Uh, it's about creating dependency. Uh, it's about gaining legitimacy for consumerism. It's about preventing. Uh, uh, dissent or opposition in the classroom when schools enter into contracts with corporations there's often explicit restrictions on the kind of things that teachers can and can't say in the classroom about that corporation so freedom of speech becomes very important. Okay, so uh, now we're going to get into the uh, looking more explicitly uh, at a rent uh, in, the, in one chapter where I do that but I should also say that really a rent is the major conceptual framework behind the whole project, her notion of politics uh, and its, its uh, challenges that it's, it's facing in modernity really inform the whole conceptual structure.
So I think what is uh, most noteworthy in the work of Arendt is how she extends the meaning of both politics and the public so as to equate them with the reality of the world itself. Yet yeah, Arendt acknowledges the difficulty of taking seriously the idea of a public, observing that, quote, misunderstanding and equating the political and social realms has become even more confusing in modern usage and modern understanding of society. And she speaks of the, quote, extraordinary difficulty with which we understand the decisive division between the public and private realms. So I talk a little bit about some of the challenges I think that we encounter to, in, in understanding the importance of the public. Uh, first, that, uh, at least in the context of school commercialism and the commercialization of educational developments, that the idea of the public is sometimes uh, considered to be an intangible or a very ethereal concept. For example, when it comes to uh, people's concerns about the influence of commercialism or consumerism in the school context, issues like the environmental consequences uh, or healthcare issues that arise are often more immediate or more persuasive to people because there is concrete, tangible benefits. And if, so if I make an argument to parents about the you know, diabetes and, and this kind of thing, uh, or pollution, then they're often more, more persuasive than if I make something seemingly abstract about you know, the consequences for our experience with the public. Uh, a second uh, is that there's, there's a common prevalent assumption, I think, that any gathering of people of any sport whether it be a television audience uh, or a gathering of people in a shopping mall or something, that there's a, there's a common assumption that the public is simply just any gathering of people. So I think this is one of the other impediments to understanding where rent is coming from. And uh, a third one is that I think one of the interesting things about consumerism is not only that I think it's per pervasive, uh, but it's also very seductive. And there is, as an ideology, it can be uh, People have very, very deeply adopted it, and so when they bring up arguments about the importance of the public, there's often, uh, you know, extreme deep uh, resistance against the idea that consumerism can have a present threat to the public. But I th fourth, and I think what is most interesting about uh, life in a consumer society is that the public itself now increasingly has the function of promoting consumerism. So let me read a bit more about that. Uh, in fact, public space itself is often used even to advance consumerism when viewed by marketers as a resource to be exploited. Not only is the public lost, but it is replaced with things that advance consumerism. For example, monstrous billboards hanging down apartment buildings. In fact, I can see one from my office at the University of Toronto. It's about uh, 12 stores big, uh, covers most of the side of an apartment building. And every three or four months, I, I see people up there changing it. Uh, uh, political leaders like Bush calling upon the population to go shopping and the widespread use of the media to advance consumerism. It is easy to continue to assume that the public realm exists as long as there are, quote, public places. Even as consumer messages spread to places like park benches, postal boxes, public washrooms, and library cards. I don't know if you're having this uh, issue in the U.S. right now, but in Toronto, because of a budget crisis, there is a growing pressure to allow advertising in parks, uh, on park benches, or even set up uh, information kiosks, uh, where you know one side of it would, would have a map or you know a little bit of information, but the other side would be a large billboard. So more and more of these so-called public places are being uh, infiltrated by, by commercial messages. A concrete and tangible example of how public space is used by marketers to promote consumerism may help demonstrate this trend. Recently in the city of Toronto, several buildings in a downtown corner were demolished to make way for a new public square. According to the municipal government, the function of the square is to, is to quote, promote economic development activities. The surrounding buildings display dozens of billboards and huge TV screens. And the job description for the recently advertised new position of the manager for this uh, public square, reveals how public space is conceived. Quote, the successful applicant will be an innovative, dynamic entrepreneur with demonstrated ability to successfully lead a business unit of similar scope and will support the preparation of business plans and develop and implement both marketing plans to attract commercial events and activities 
and new ideas and initiatives for revenue generation. So this to me when I read this was quite striking. This is a conception of what the public is. Uh, the public realm, the, its function is to generate revenue. Uh, it is to be administered by dynamic entrepreneurs. Uh, it is described as a business unit. The public sphere is now a business unit. As this description makes parent, the public space is construed as an opportunity for revenue generation and the promotion of consumerism. That's managed by marketers and operate according to the same principles of profit and return on investment as a private corporation. The Meslin of a group in Toronto called the Toronto Public Space Committee asks, quote, instead of the Young Dundas Square, which is the name of this place, uh, why don't they just name it the Young Dundas Business Unit? <laughs> Well, the practice of producing, promoting, and profiting from the public realm becomes increasingly lucrative. A rent's account of the public reveals this conception, conception as an event. All sides of the public square are lined with screens and advertising. People are entirely surrounded by signs and symbols of consumerism. This dearth of a meaningful public realm gives power to those who can fill such a void by seeing by seeming to speak of something larger and more substantial than private consumption. Arendt argues that although we live in a time that privileges the private and neglects the public, we as human beings remain inherently political. This is, I think, our Aristotelian influence goes back to the Aristotle quote I began with. These examples indicate that we are unaccustomed to meaningful engagement in the political realm and are left vulnerable to corrupt evocations of the public. Okay, so I'm going to skip some biography uh, and a brief section I have uh, on addressing a, a, a critique of her that she is what's been called a Hellenic nostalgic, that she's all about she's doing is kind of you know longing for the Greeks and, and you know simply anti-modernist. So I address that objection, and now more substantially, I'll get into uh, what is actually the center of the book and the center of this chapter. Um, uh, Arendt's, uh, Arendt's account of the uh, activities and conditions. Arendt's theoretical method consists of exposing ruptures, reversals, and distinctions. Ruptures within the history of the West, reversals of publicity and privacy, and of the categorical distinction between human activities necessary for their conceptual illumination. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the human condition. This account of ruptures in the history of Western philosophy points towards the retreat of the public realm and the human potential for political action through the reduction of difference and plurality into the sameness and conformity of what she calls the social. Perhaps what is most notable and unique about her approach to political thought is the firmness with which she insists on certain categorical distinctions and her intention to clarify these distinctions and restore a sense of conceptual clarification. Arendt is concerned that the growing incapacity to make distinctions results in, in, quote, a generalization in which the words themselves lose all meaning. This kind of confusion where everything distinct disappears and everything that is new and shocking, shocking is not explained but explained away, either through drawing some analogies or reducing it to a previously known chain of causes and influences seems to be the hallmark of the modern historical and political sciences. The basis for Arendt's distinctions frequently lies in her appeal to the ancient meanings of certain terms that she evokes in order to reawaken us to the dangers inherent in the erosion of the capacity for language to convey meaning. This is not simply to imply a true, pure, or unchanging meaning of such terms, but rather to indicate a way of understanding that strikes our ears as strange that words might also mean something quite different from their common and contemporary usage. Uh, in her search for etymological explanations, she presents distinctions that she argues are fundamental to understanding the challenges consumers presents to a healthy and active political life. I think this is one interesting distinction between her and Heidegger, who uh, uses you know, a great deal of Greek terminology, uh, sometimes Latin terminology, and, and often a uh, phrase that are best not translated into English. When reading Heidegger, we, it's very, there's always explicit reminders that you should read them uh, carefully and that he's using distinct terminology. Arentis does use Greek words occasionally, but it's easier to slip into the habit of kind of thinking that 
when she uses a word like option or whatever, uh, she means what we mean. And so there's a, a danger in that we can, we can be more easily misled. That's not to advocate for you know, deliberately using uh, Greek or German words, but just that it's, it's more easy to read our own meaning into it. Okay, so now I'm going to focus on the three activities. Labor, the first of the three activities, is grounded in the human condition of life, the biological life process to which we are bound by virtue of being human, compelled to submit to and preoccupy ourselves with self-preservation and species preservation. Labor is the private activity that provides for the biological continuation of life, in which the human body, quote, concentrates on nothing but its own being alive. Labor, as the source of all property, is the endless taken from nature and returning to it through consumption. Because none of the products of human labor are lasting or durable, labor is described by a red as futile. It is the activity in which we are irre irrevocably bound to the unending cycle of production and consumption, the two stages through which the ever-recurrent cycle of biological life must pass. The cyclical character of labor makes private life uniform and the private realm or oikos a location of conformity. There are several, quote, what she calls labor theorists, whose writings have contributed to advancing the importance of this activity. Uh, Rent identifies John Locke, Adam Smith, and Karl Marx as theorists who consider acquisition, property, exchange, and labor to be located among the highest human activities. Despite political differences, the common element of these thinkers is their unprecedented elevation of the labor activity itself, now quote, considered to be the supreme world-building activity or capacity of man. Uh, Rand continues, quote, the sudden spectacular rise of labor from the lowest, most despised position to the highest rank, as the most esteemed of all human activities, began when Locke discovered that labor is a source of all property. It followed its course when Adam Smith asserted that labor was a source of all wealth, and found its climax in Marx's system of labor, where labor became the source of all productivity and the expression of the very humanity of man. End quote. So these three, they were, these three theorists uh, emphasize in various ways the way in which our consciousness is determined by the ownership of voter production, the way in which tremendous gains and efficiency can be achieved through division of labor, like the beginning of the Wealth of Nations. Uh, and elsewhere in the Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith says something like, um, what defines us as human is our capacity to go to the market and exchange our goods. Uh, Kimberly Curtis notes that these theorists consider labor our, quote, highest purpose. The dynamic devouring social life process becomes, for all three, the highest purpose of our collective life. Privacy here implies primitive, to be deprived of something essential. Although Rent describes this realm as primitive, we have, understood, we have misunderstood her if we accuse her of simply condemning labor or the private realm. Labor is considered an essential human activity, and the oikos, respected as a place where we we can feel, quote, sheltered against the world, a place where consumption should be hidden. The importance of privacy can be determined only to the extent that it contributes to those activities within the Vita Activa that it must serve if human existence is to be considered worldly and free. Yet as long as we are bound in this process and restricted to our own privacy, our efforts are futile, and we remain isolated within ourselves unable to engage in the realm of human affairs and effectively disclose our goals through speech. Animal laborance as labor personified is bound to necessity and therefore does not appear to others, unable to communicate experience and subjectivity. It is though he did not exist. We are pulled into the cyclical process of consumption and exist in a, quote, mere togetherness within the private realm where we are neither seen nor heard. Uh, now I move to action at the other end of the spectrum. Continuing with Arendt's account of the rise of consumerism, labor is contrasted with action both in its location in the world and its importance within the Vida Activa. Action is the highest activity in which humans can engage. It expresses our highest potentialities and possibilities through which we are known by others, disclose our uniqueness, and participate in something larger than ourselves. A life without action 
quote, is literally dead to the world. It has ceased to be a human life because it is no longer lived among men. Whereas labor is grounded in the human condition of life, action is grounded in the human condition of plurality. It is the articulation of difference where we distinguish ourselves from others. She contends that both the meaning of the action and the identity of the actor can be established only in the context of human plurality. In the presence of others, you are able to understand and recognize the uniqueness of our acts. Because action is the, quote, only activity that goes on directly between us without the intermediary of things or matter, by acting, we experience ourselves and each other without mediating these relationships with objects or commodities. It is through action that our identity and our uniqueness can be disclosed and made known to others, through which we, quote, insert ourselves into the human world. This human world, a rent called the space of appearance. For Arendt, although we may be political animals, the public realm does not exist, quote, by nature. Only through our own efforts does an always fragile public realm emerge, in need of continual renewal through political action and the move movement from private concerns to public engagement. Thus, the polis and action are mutually interdependent, because while action is needed to preserve the polis, so too is the polis needed to preserve action. While the polis is the location for action, so too is it the place where action is preserved through speech. The polis is where we not only differentiate ourselves from others, but also differentiate between production and consumption as, quote, activities related to a common world and those related to the maintenance of life. It has often been said that Arendt developed a political phenomenology or phenomenology of politics, insofar as she brought Heidegger's ontological categories of being and revealing to bear on political questions. Politics for Arendt is the activity by which we publicly present ourselves before others to be seen and known and heard. A movement from the, quote, darkness of the private to the light of public appearances is not equivalent to the emergence from the platonic cave of doxa and ignorance into the full light of the good as outlined in Book 7 of the Republic. Arendt's account is not the journey of the philosopher, but of the political actor, for whom the public constitutes a realm for self-disclosure and appearance. She insists that, quote, without the space of appearance, neither the reality of oneself nor the reality of this surrounding world can be established. We only are when we appear, and that appearance is contingent on a public. However, our end chain of the human world, quote, is not forced upon us by necessity, like labor, and it is not prompted by utility, like work. Appearance is not driven by a rational, purposive, purposive concern oriented towards instrumental ends, but is the condition under which freedom appears only after such concerns are set aside. This appearance is contingent on difference in plurality, which emerge from contrasting perspectives, quote, the reality of the public realm relies on the simultaneous presence of innumerable perspectives and aspects. Being seen and heard by others uh, derive their significance from the fact that everyone sees and hears from a different position. This is the meaning of public life. Only where things can be seen by many in a variety of aspects can worldly reality truly and reliably appear. Okay, uh, now a section called Consumer Society and the Rise of the Social from Vita Activa to Vita Accumulativa. <laughs> For Arendt, the public and private realms and their corresponding activities are not historically static in their relation to each other. That is, they may change in relative importance throughout history, a trend that has become even more pronounced today. Quote, Although misunderstanding and equating the political and social realms is as old as the translation of Greek terms into Latin and their adaptation to Roman Christian thought, it has become even more confusing in modern usage and modern understanding of society. In fact, the social affects both private and public realms, changing almost beyond recognition the meaning of public and pro public and their significance for the life of the individual and the citizen. Arendt argues that beginning with the rise of the labor theorists, action and the political life 
have been marginalized as the private concern of the oikos were elevated to a place of liberal governance. Arendt defines this reversal of public and private spheres as the rise of the social realm, a relatively new phenomenon whose origin coincided with the emergence of the modern age. With the loss of action in the public, freedom becomes reduced to routinized behavior, difference in plurality to conformism and uniformity, and speech and self-disclosure to production and consumption. Instead of appearing through action and speech in the public, humans are reduced to mere adjuncts to the cycle of production and consumption, while the bolus is required to enable the cycle's smooth functioning and progressive acceleration. And by that point about the role of the bolus, I think of examples like Bush telling the population to go shopping, I think of public spheres having the function to promote consumerism. The social realm is a community centered on the cyclical process of production and consumption in which human self-understanding becomes based on what has been called possessive individualism and speech subjected to commercial discourse. It is the end of action and speech. Okay, so uh, between action and labor, Arendt situates work, the activity that corresponds with the human capacity to build and maintain those physical things essential for political life. While always a fundamental activity, work became increasingly significant during the Enlightenment and the rise of modern science. Work can be differentiated from labor on at least two levels, its relation with nature and the duration of its products. Whereas labor is bound to the recurring cycles of nature, uh, homo faber works upon and values nature for its use and sees it as the, quote, almost worthless material upon which to work. Homo faber reduces nature to a mere means, shaping and transforming it according to human needs and desires through instrumentalizing it. While working, we are engaging in the endless process of resisting the persistent threat of being overwhelmed by the cyclical growth and decay of nature, of sustaining existence in the face of nature. It is the process by which we transform nature into the lasting and enduring human artifice that constitutes the location for political life. Quoting John Locke, Arendt argues that, quote, nature seen through the eyes of the animal laborans is the great provider of all good things, which belong equally to all her children, who take them out of her hands and mix them with labor and consumption. The same nature seen through the eyes of Homo Faber, the builder of the world, furnishes only the almost worthless material themselves, whose value lies in the work performed upon them. Uh, whereas animal laborans leaves nothing lasting because its products are immediately consumed, work creates an enduring human artifice. Rather than disappearing through consumption, the human artifice provides a home through which the stability and solidity of the world made by human hands. Work then corresponds to worldliness because it, because it is a world building activity. And Homo Faber creates the public world, both physically and institutionally, by constructing such things as buildings and laws. It is within the realm of these durable artifacts that we, quote, dwell. Arendt finds this activity exemplified in the physical objects of a table and chair, which indicate that while the products of labor are to be immediately consumed, work differs in duration. Tables and chairs last long enough to provide the stability required for political life to emerge. Furthermore, this example points toward the way in which the human artifice draws humans together at the same time that it separates them, allowing for distinctness and plurality to become manifested. This example also demonstrates that Arendt doesn't condemn it outright, but is concerned about the implications when other dimensions of human existence are altered. Arendt is concerned about the conflation of work and action and argues that the emphasis on making and fabrication as a central activity of homo faber applies the, quote, process character of action to all human undertakings. However, Arendt argues that being is contingent on political appearance and that what she calls the concept of process is to be held or contained within the oikos. Quote, in the place of the concept of being, we now find the concept of process. And whereas it is in the nature of being to appear and thus disclose itself, 
and is in the nature of process to remain invisible. Once Homo Faber enters the political realm and transforms politics into, quote, work, an expectation that human undertakings be subject to the same standards of predictability and control as work will be created. The result of the victory of Homo Faber is what Arendt calls, quote, earthly alienation. We come to live surrounded by objects and their signs, or representations, which for Arendt do not comprise the political world, but instead a world of consumption. As a result, something fundamental to our humanity and political existence is lost. However, Arendt is quick to point out that Homo Faber's rise soon became dominated by animal laborans and the human condition of life. In other words, she begins with a description of the rise of Homo Faber and work, and then moves on to the way in which both work and action are eclipsed by the rise of labor. Uh, what, what, quote, what needs explanation is not the modern esteem of Homo Faber, but the fact that this esteem was so quickly followed by the elevation of laboring to the highest position in the hierarchy, or hierarchical order of the Dida Activa. It is important to note that the modern decline did not stop with the establishment of the rule of Homo Faber and the threat of modern science, but continued to the final victory of the social. Whereas work resulted in what Arendt called earthly alienation, the primacy of animal abhorrence results in worldly alienation, an experience that arises when humans are left without a world in which to dwell. We instead dwell in a world of what we produce and consume. Arendt describes the character of this world, worldlessness. One of the obvious danger signs that we may be on our way to bringing into existence the ideal of the animal abhorrence is the extent to which our whole economy has become a waste economy. This is quite interesting. This is her writing in the mid-50s about a waste economy. Uh, continuing, in which things must be almost as quickly devoured and discarded as they have appeared in the world, if the process itself is not to come to a sudden catastrophic end. But if the ideal were already in existence and we were truly nothing but members of a consumer society, we would no longer live in the world at all, but simply be driven by a process in whose ever-recurrent cycles Things appear and disappear, manifest themselves and vanish, never to last long enough to surround the life process of their midst. End quote. The danger is that we become surrounded by artificial things and therefore suspicious and even resentful towards what we did not make and cannot reduce to consumption. In becoming surrounded by commodities, we grow hostile to anything that is not a commodity and anything that is not of our making. Arendt speaks of, quote, modern man's deep-rooted suspicion of everything he did not make himself, end quote. Because we resent what we did not make, we seek to exchange it for something we have made ourselves, and thereby, quote, rebel against the world as it has been given. And that's one of the first, uh, that's one of the first pages in the human condition. The human condition, I think, is, begins with this phenomenon of uh, rebellion against the human condition as it's been given, as she phrased it. And in that beginning chapter, she put that in the context of the launch of Sputnik. Uh, but here, I think, a uh, rebellion against the world has been given is, is not only true of the case of Sputnik, but also consumerism. Something fundamentally important about ourselves is compromised as a result. Arendt states that, quote, this earthly home became a world, in the proper sense of the word, only when the totality of fabricated things is so organized that it can resist the consuming life process of the people dwelling in it. Instead, in a consumer society, the products of work are increasingly consumed and drawn into the cyclical movement of production and consumption. Okay, consumerism is therefore not so much like the tendency to view the world as objects to use, but rather as objects to use up. Arendt describes the consequences of the unleashed, devouring life process of consumerism as follows. I have a somewhat lengthy quote from Rent. Painless and effortless consumption would not change, but would only increase the devouring character of biological life, until mankind, uh, altogether liberated from the shackles of pain and effort, would be free to consume the whole world and reproduce all things it wished to consume. How many things would appear and disappear daily and hourly in a life process of such a society would at best be immaterial for the world. 
If the world and its thing character could withstand the reckless dynamism of a wholly motorized life process at all. The danger of future automation is less the much deplored mechanization and artificialization of natural life than that its artificiality notwithstanding, all human productivity would be sucked into an enormously intensified life process and would follow automatically without pain or effort. End quote. Worldly alienation arises when our physical structures built to provide the lasting and durable environment for our political life are caught up in the accelerating process of decay and, decay and lost to the endless stream of consumption and production. While Arendt emphasizes the importance of the public, she does not celebrate any or all forms of human community. A group or, a, or assembly of people is not necessarily a public, but may simply be a collection of private persons, what David Reisman calls, quote, the lonely crowd. Regarding the title of uh, Elizabeth Gold's book, quote, The Consumer Republic, Benjamin Barber points out that the term consumer republic is in fact a contradiction in terms. Quote, this is Benjamin Barber, champions of the idea that consumers are democratic citizens have tried to have their civic cake and consume it too by talking about consumer sovereignty and consumer republic, end quote. Yet a republic is defined by its publicness, the Latin res publica, meaning things of the public. And what is public cannot be determined by consulting or aggregating private desires. The consumer's republic is quite simply an oxymoron. Consumers cannot be sovereign, only citizens can. In Arendtian terms, a, quote, republic of consumers is a community of private persons, all behaving in a normalized and predictable fashion without any experience of plurality or sense of their political character. Arid, impersonal, and in inhospitable, it is a collection of grasping persons united only by their self-preoccupation, unable to leave behind the self-absorbed self. Such a community arises from the activity of work, the agora, the exchange market. However, unlike the polis, this community is motivated by, quote, the desire for products, not people, where humans express themselves not as persons, but producers of products, end quote. Like tables and chairs, the products of work enable a context for action and speech, not merely exchange. It is noteworthy that the agora is physically held within the polis, not vice versa. However, the fundamental danger in a consumer society is the reversible when the agora eclipses or even consumes the polis. This dynamic is well summarized in a classic sales book that describes the importance of creating, quote, the buying mood. So I have a passage from that book. The president of a large chain organization recently revealed his methods that he uses in selecting the location of his stores. His conclusion suggests an important aspect of selling. He said, quote, the big thing is to be where people pass who are in the buying mood. It does, not matter, it does not matter how many people are going along the sidewalk if they are thinking of something other than buying. If they are intent on getting to their work or getting to lunch or getting home, if they have some other purpose in mind, then their number means little to us. That is why we like to be near other scores. You might think that we would want to get away from competitors. Nothing of the sort. They bring business. We want to be where there are lots of people, and most of them are in the buying mood. This successful merchant expresses a truth that many salesmen never discover, that the sale is possible only when the customer drops all other interests and activities and passes into that mental state, which we call the buying attitude. The central question is how to arouse this mood." End quote. This buying mood is highly destructive of political life and transformed the polis into a site of friends and exchange. We could add that the central question is not only how to arouse this mood, but how can this mood be made as socially pervasive and permanent as possible such that it eclipses other concerns. The aim is to gather people together, provoking the buying mood, and then sell this public for profit, even if the public is school children. Many of the characters of the social result from its correspondence to one um, human condition, life itself. The life process reflects the very devouring character of life itself, 
As a consequence, consumerism threatens the highest activity within the vida activa, and the highest condition under which uh, human life on Earth has been given. Okay, I'm actually going to skip ahead one paragraph. Uh, a contemporary social theorist, Sigmund Bauman, agrees with Arendt's concern about public and private inflation, lamenting that the passage, quote, the passage between private and public have been thrown wide open, and that one consequence of this conflation and loss of the public is the, quote, what he calls the individualization of political problems. He describes several examples of the problematic implications of allowing privacy in the public. The individualizing and privatizing of political problems through, quote, confessional television obscures their more pressing political character. Quote, around the institution of the chat show, a community is created. It is, however, an oxymoronic community, a community of individuals united only by their self-enclosure and self-containment, end quote. This undermines the possible development of a political language or ability to deal with political problems by reinforcing isolated, subjective, and private experience. Concurring with Arendt's account of the potentialities of action, Bauman argues that politics is the project of transforming subjective experiences into a collective political action, private malaise into public engagement. Instead, as the private becomes explicit, the political becomes obscured, and what is strengthened is a language for expressing private and subjective experience without an equivalent or comparable political language. A quote from him, politics is many things, but it would hardly be any of them were it not the art of translating individual problems into public issues and common interests into individual rights and duties. Private issues are permitted in the public realm, yet political problems such as consumerism are left to private, quote, choice. The individualizing and privatizing of political problems obscures the extent to which uh, private problems may in fact have uh, political solutions. What emerges in the place of the public is a community centered on consumption, in which human self-understanding becomes uh, based on possession, action reduces